Hey, the internet. My name is Mitch, and I'm so glad that you're tuning into Suncrest On Demand. Today, we're diving into a new series called You in Five Years, and I know that I'm excited because I have a hard time even thinking about what I'm having for dinner every night. So I could use all the help I can get in looking towards the life that God has in store for me. And I know that if you're open to it, the next three weeks can be helpful and meaningful for you too. Last week, we kicked off a Bible listening plan to help us take back lost time in our day. Wanting to join in on that plan? Pull out your phone, start a new message conversation, and text HEAR YEAR, just as you see it on the screen, to 94000. You'll get helpful resources to make the most of this journey as we go through scripture together. While we're texting, some of you are watching your first Suncrest On Demand, and I am super excited that you're here. Would you send us the word Suncrest to 94,000? When you do that, we'll send a digital gift card directly to your phone for some coffee. And once you're done texting us, head to the App Store and download the Suncrest app. That'll give you insider access to things like past content, upcoming events, stuff for your kids, and much more. You can also partner with us financially on our app or on our website. If you want to write a check or give cash, feel free to drop that off uh, at our office this week. On behalf of all of us here, thank you for using your finances to change lives. And speaking of changing lives with your finances, did you know that you, yes, you, were part of the largest compassion offering that we've ever received through the Christmas season? With your help, over $90,000 is going directly to making a difference throughout Northwest Indiana and beyond. Well done, and thanks for your generosity. Here's how the rest of this video is gonna go. One, we're gonna listen to a song together. I'm a singy type person, so I like to sing along. If you're not, feel free to reflect on the lyrics and find a meaningful line in this song. In fact, leave us a comment or live chat with the, with the line that you liked. Two, we're gonna take communion together. So now's the time to gather some food and drink to represent Jesus' body and blood. After the song is done, we'll put up a timer and a short prayer on the screen, and then, Feel free to eat and drink when you're ready. Three, after that, we'll hear from lead pastor Greg Lee as he teaches episode one of You in Five Years. Four, when that's done, let us know something meaningful that you heard in the experiences message. Maybe something big, could be something small. Either way, let me know. With that, let's take a listen to this song together.
Um, you know, one of the things that's been interesting to me when I was starting to think about this series, You in Five Years, I want you to, I want you to think about the big picture, of course, to start to look out into the future and imagine what life might be like. But any st- time you start to think about five years from now, it'll cause you to think about just the nature of time. And we actually have some phrases or things that you've heard about time that helps us begin to think like, yeah, time is kind of an odd thing if you think about it. I mean, how many times have you heard the, the phrase, hurry up and wait, right? We just put those two things together and, and they don't really go together, but we feel that sometimes. When I was a, a parent of young children, somebody said this to me, you've probably heard other people say it. They said, now remember this, the days are long and the years are short. Have you heard that before? about raising kids. If you haven't, you have to know it's absolutely true. Like sorry, half the, halfway through the afternoon, you're like, how am I ever going to get to the end of this day? And then five years, you're like, where did that go? It's kind of wild. And you know, time is an interesting thing because we can remember certain things from the past, sometimes accurately and sometimes with nostalgia. And we can envision our future, but sometimes we just dream these dreams that just pass away. And other times we imagine something that it's almost like God wants us to do it and we start to lock in. And so I wanna lead you on a little journey of thinking about time today. Now, sometimes it seems like things fly by and sometimes it seems like things slow down so much. And I want you to remember back just to the very beginning days of the pandemic when we experienced it. This is kind of the middle of March. I mean, it had been in the news in January and February and there were starting to be certain things, but all of a sudden within just a few days, you know, the president comes on TV and there's shutdowns of traveling to Europe. We were planning a Thursday service one night. We had it planned. We were ready to go at five o'clock and the governor came and said, oh, let's not do any gatherings. And we had to shut down the 645 service. Within days, the NCAA basketball tournament all came to a halt. The stock market went from like 28,000 to 18,000. And if you remember those days, like it's almost like everything slowed down because there was a new intensity and you had to kind of mark every moment. Some of you didn't know. Many of us didn't know. If Would we still have a job the next week? How serious is the virus? Is it deadly? Is it, 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 should I be worried about my own health? How worried should I be? And when we get in those moments, you, you might even remember this, we got to the end of March, like just two weeks after everything kind of blew up and everyone's like, it's just the end of March. Everything just slowed down. And it was actually right in that season where I had planned a message series called You in Five Years. And I thought, there's no way I'm gonna do a message series asking people to think about life five years from now. This message series should be You in Five Days. That's what it should have been at that moment, right? To think, what's life even going to be like? And so I put this series on hold and I've kind of been looking at it, uh, you know, at different points during the year. And I thought the start of 2021, I think is the right time. Because things aren't back to normal. Things will probably never be back to what was normal. Things are starting to get a little bit familiar again. And I think it's the right time to lift our eyes up 
and think beyond five days or even five months and start to think, okay, God, five years from now, what would life be like for me? So I have a very simple goal for week one. This is the week one goal that you would just begin imagining yourself in five years. We're gonna spend three weeks on this topic and you don't have to lock in on anything for until we're done with the series. So you have time. Actually, what I want to do with today is just to begin imagining, ask you to begin imagining five years from now in life. Now, I think if we start to think about a five-year increment, it's a little easier if we look back five years first before we look forward. So we're in 2021 right now. I want all of you to think back to 2016. 2016. Think about how old you were in 2016. Think about how old your kids were. Some of you have the same job that you had in 2016. Many of you have a different job. Some of you have had three jobs in between that. Some of you are married to the same person you were in 2016. Some of you are married to a different person. Some of you weren't married and now you're now married. Some of you were married and now you're not married. Lots can happen in five years. I actually went back and this is just from a Suncrest perspective, I took a look at you know, some of our stats and, and you know, some of our records. And in January, 2016, Suncrest was a church with three campuses. There's a campus in Hobart and a campus in Highland and a campus in St. John. It was actually in January of 2016, five years ago this month, that we were transitioning the church, the campus that was in Hobart to become a brand new church of its own, kind of an amazing thing that God put together. And it was awesome. And we launched that out. Now, now get this, just this week, I had the chance to go do a little photo opportunity because there's an awesome magazine that's doing a story about all the medical debt relief that we've done and how all churches came together. And one of the churches that helped us with that medical debt relief is the church that came out of that Hobart campus. And I think, if you had asked me five years ago, what's going to happen? I could have never told you about that. It seems so long ago. I remember... You, I don't expect you to remember, but the sermon series that I did five years ago in January, it was called Flip the Script. It was about how we deceive ourselves sometimes and you gotta set your mind right to think about the right things. But here's why I remember that. I attach newcomers that I get to know with the sermon series that was going on when they first came. And actually there's a couple at Suncrest, a family, young family. They came actually on Christmas Eve at the invitation of their brother in 2015 and then they came back in January of 2016 and they were here for that series and it started a progression of transformation in their life. They did not believe in who Christ was. And over five years of that journey, they explored this faith. They started to change their mind about who God was. They surrendered their lives to Christ. They were baptized. They started to raise their kids in a new way. They set the course of their business in a new way. They started to serve here. Now they start to lead here. One of them leads here on the stage, helping it lead us in worship you know, pretty often. It's just a remarkable story of all that can happen in five years. This past year, that family endured quite a bit of tragedy, a lot of hardship, and I saw them navigate it with a trust in God, with a confidence in the grace of God, with a sense of the calling of God on their life to lead their family through difficult things. And I just think, wow, five years, five years. For some of you, the highlight of 2016 was a World Series championship, right? Isn't that wild? That was five years ago. Just 103 years to go until your next World Series championship for the Chicago Cubs. This is kind of the pace that you're on. I'm just helping you out, helping you out a little bit with that. So five years, like that's, it's a long time when you think of all that can happen in five years. Now, I want to shift, Don't, instead of looking back, to look to the future. So I'm going to do a little practice, a little exercise here in the room. You'll all participate with me, I'm confident. Um, I want you to say out loud how old you are right now. Don't say it yet. I want us to all say it together so as to drown out your individual announcement of your age. So at the count of three and online also, let's just all say out loud how old we are right now. All right. One, two, three. I'm 46. Very good. Very good. Well done. So you heard me say that I'm 46 right now. Now this is the next thing. Like picture yourself. Are, are you where you thought you'd be in life at the age where you are right now? Kind of an interesting question. Now, 
Fast forward five years, you can do this math. It's not that hard, okay? Just add five to the number you just said out loud, okay? We're gonna say all this out loud again, just kind of get in our minds. What age will we be five years from now? Count of three, online and personal, let's say it together. One, two, three, I'll be 51. Did you hear me say 51? 51. I like remember my grandparents when they were in their 50s. I'm like, it doesn't seem very cool to be 51. Luckily, I have five years until I'm 51. Now, when you start to think, where will I be in life at the age that I just announced? What's the picture of that? Some of you could do the same exercise with the ages of your kids and it will start to blow your mind a little bit. My kids, 20, 17, 14, and two. 20, 17, 14, and two. That means five years from now? <laughs> 25, 22, 19. The three oldest, all out of high school. That's because I'll be 51 and old, okay? Like, like I can't even picture that, but I should because if I want my family to be a certain way five years from now when my kids are at that stage, now would be a great time to start aiming at something. And our two-year-old will be seven, which will make me the oldest dad at like the second grade choir program that's going on at school. Picture yourself five years from now. Now, all I really wanna do with the rest of this message is start to open up your mind so you can start to imagine this, right? I wanna give you a lot to consider. There's much to consider. I wanna give you lots of ideas, lots of ways you could start thinking about this, some ways that you shouldn't think about it. And then I also wanna give you some time to decide. Again, until the series is over, you don't need to lock in on the picture of what you're going to be five years from now. But we are all going to go on a journey together so that we can start to aim at something that is five years from now. Now, five years is enough time that you could start to lock in on some significant things. If you wanted to learn a new language, you could do that in five years. Five years is definitely enough time to do that. Some of you could get a degree that you don't have right now, and you should start to aim at that so that life five years from now could be different than life is right now, if you started training now, almost everyone in this room could run a marathon five years from now. You could easily put together a plan that leads you to a 5K you know, later this year and then a 10K. You, you could build your way. Everyone, almost every one of us could run a 5K or a marathon five years from now. Start to think about your relationships how different they could be. You could have, if you wanted to, a radical transformation of your soul. If you aimed at it in the next five years and you stayed on course for that. Of course, there's also plenty of potential storylines that aren't as good. Five years from now, you could have racked up a ton of credit card debt that you don't have right now. Five years from now, your marriage that you're in right now, because you didn't give attention to it, it could be lame or destroyed. Five years from now, you could be in prison because you made a stupid decision or you made a calculated decision. And that's where it ended up. There's lots of places you could be five years from now. And I wanna ask you to start thinking about those. Now, there's really two paths that you can take when you think about life five years from now. One path is one I wanna ask you not to take. There's a great temptation to go the route of comparison, where the way you shape your vision for five years from now is that you look around at what everyone else is doing. And I gotta tell you, the scriptures would suggest to you and to me that this is one of the greatest temptations in our lives. One of the 10 commandments is do not covet. And it's not because God doesn't just, he doesn't, not that he just doesn't want you to be envious all the time and carry that around. It's because he has a plan for your life and he has a plan for other people's lives. And every time you look at someone else's life and you think, oh, I wish that was my life. That comparison steals from the plan that he has in your life. But it's so easy, isn't it? 
to drive up to your friend's house and their house is so much nicer than yours. And then start to think, I wish my house was like their house. You look at a friend's vacation that they're going on and you start to think, oh, I wish I could have that vacation. You look at how a friend's body looks and you're like, ah, man, their body looks great. I wish my body looked like that. Sometimes you even look at a friend's spouse and you think, I kind of like their spouse better than I like my spouse. And of course, what's happening is you are getting a surface level view of life. You have a surface level view of everyone else's life. Everyone knows these days, right, that the social media stream you see from all your friends and acquaintances the things you're so jealous of, it's really just their highlight reel. And sometimes it's even better than their highlight reel because it's not even real what they're posting. But you could scroll through that all night long and think, oh, I wish my life was like that. But this comparison trap to say, oh, I want my life to be like theirs. It's not a good game. Let me give you two passages of scripture that I think will shine some light on this. In the Old Testament, when um, David is being selected as the next king of Israel, um, we get this passage. It says, the Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And every time we play the comparison game and we compare our life to someone else's, all we're comparing with is the outward appearance. And for some of you, we could just be honest, like when you set your goals of what you want your life to be like, a lot of it could have to do with outward appearance. And I wanna, I wanna save you from that temptation here. I know it's a temptation. A few years ago, I dug out a thing I had done in high school about goals for my life. And one of the goals among many was that at the stage of life I'm at right now, the goal was that I would be driving, this was the quote, a sophisticated sports car. Um, Right now, I'm driving a 2006 Honda Odyssey with 269,000 miles on it. Woo! I, I actually, I told my daughter this morning, we talk about this, I actually love this van. I told her, I think it's got 400,000 miles in it. <laughs> Me in five years, hopefully still driving the 2006 Honda Odyssey. But here's the thing, like, okay, if you want to have a sophisticated sports car or if you happen to have one right now, like I'm not saying you're evil, you're not. Like it's, it's okay, it's okay. I hope you're being generous. Like don't do that and not be generous, but it, nothing wrong, sophisticated sports car. Unless it's the aim of your life for the next five years. If the aim of your life is to move into a really nice house or take the trip of all time or drive this kind of car, you're a loser. Right? I'm just, I, according to the Bible, not according to, I mean, people look at the outward appearance. Of course, we look around. But God, there's something so much more significant. You would want to look at your heart. There's another thing the scriptures say, and the scriptures say this repeatedly, like dozens of times. And so I'll just, I'll just use one example of it. It says, do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today, to the right or to the left, following other gods and serving them. And the idea behind this commandment to say, hey, stay on the straight line, look straight ahead, follow what God has for you. Do not be tempted to turn to the right or to, to the left. But this isn't about necessarily aiming at useless things. It's being distracted by lesser things which is actually the casualty of most good goals, right? Why is it that you didn't follow through on the resolutions you made last year or maybe already the resolutions you made this year? It wasn't because they weren't good goals. It's because you got distracted. You didn't, you didn't stay on course. You went to the right or to the left. And then once you got distracted, it kind of all fell apart and you never got back on course. And so this notion of, Getting clear on what's in front of us is a big deal. So if that's the temptation, here's the approach. 
In week one, I wanted you to think about some meditation this week. And I'm going to describe what that is. It's looking up and it's looking within to shape our vision. Instead of looking around and comparing ourselves and say, well, look what she's got or look what he's got or I wish my life was like that or I wish my wife was like that. Instead, this is something more substantial where we look inside ourselves, the heart, and we look up to God and we say, five years from now, God, if this was transformed in a way that aligns with you in your way, what could happen? Five years ago in 2016, Jenny and I had never had a single conversation about being foster parents. It wasn't part of our story. It wasn't on our radar. It wasn't in our mind. And five years later, as many of you know, it's been completely transformed. Kids in our lives, adopted one, hope to adopt another. Like this can happen in five years if, if, you would look within and you would look up and say, God, what do you want from me in five years? So over the course of this series, just kind of a surface level way, I want to use the story of Nehemiah from the Old Testament. I'll give you just a little bit of a background. The, the Old Testament you know, is a, is a story of God's people. And it was centered in the city of Jerusalem many times. That's, that's when they were safe and being faithful to God. But when they'd be unfaithful to God, they would get exiled, they'd get taken over by other kings and other kingdoms, and they'd move away. Well, when Nehemiah was living, they had been taken out of Jerusalem and the city of Jerusalem had been destroyed, in particular, the wall of the city that would protect them. And Nehemiah, with his life, had this sense from God that he needed to do something about it. But I want you to see how he went about it. And I wanna ask you, when you start to picture life five years from now for you to follow his example. Here's what he says, here's what it says. When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. Now, if you you wanna do something meaningful in your life, It's a very healthy process to go and say, what breaks my heart? What part of the world do I look at and say, that's not right? What part of my life do I look at and say, that's not right, it breaks my heart. I'm gonna weep over that. And it's actually in looking at some of the wrongs that are within our lives and within our world that can start to set a vision that has substance to it. And then he says, for some days, here you go, I mourned and I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. And this is what I want to ask you to begin doing this week. You start to imagine yourself at your age, whatever five years from now is. And I want you to mourn some things. Mourn some things that aren't the way you want them to be in your life. They're missing pieces of your life. There's something that's wrong, either within you or in front of you. And to let that break your heart and have some sadness and say, if I stay on the course I am, I'm not going to be where I want to be. I need to mourn some things that are wrong within my life. Some things that are missing right now. And then fast and pray to the God of heaven. Fasting, if you don't know, this is a very simple spiritual practice. It means you skip a meal, you skip a couple meals, you skip a day worth of meals, and you just use that meal time, I want you to do this this week, to talk to your father. And the idea, the most simple version of this idea is that while you feel physical hunger, you will be reminded of a hunger for God and to hear what his plan is for your life so that you're actually following through on his plan for your next five years and you mourn, and you fast, and you pray over all the, all the options that we're going to talk about today, and start to zero in, God, God, what is your plan? Nehemiah goes on. He said, then I said, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. You see what he's doing? This is part of the mourning. He's acknowledging where 
he was off a little bit. He was wrong. He's looking at where he's been wrong. He's looking at where things got wrong, passed down to him from his father's family. Like the whole course has been set and we got to redirect something. Because if you don't redirect and set in a new direction, you just keep going in the same direction. And if you're going in the wrong direction, you don't want to go in the same direction. So surely there's a piece of your life where you'd say, a healthy practice while I'm mourning and praying and fasting is just to confess to God. I've been off course. I've been aiming at lame things. I've been attracted by things that shine, you know, from an outward appearance, but God, you look at the heart. And it finishes like this. We've acted very wickedly toward you, God. We have not obeyed the commands and decrees and the laws that you gave. You gave us a North Star, God. We know what life's supposed to be about, but we went to the right or to the left. We got distracted along the way. So I want you to think about this with some context. I'm gonna give you quite a bit of context to think about your own life before we finish here. First piece of context is a story that I use all the time around here. This is really the, the story of God, right? And I always describe it as creation, then brokenness, then redemption, and then restoration. God created the world. It was perfect. It was just the way he wanted to be. At the start of your life, you were innocent. You were on court. It was, it was great. And then came the brokenness. And the world that we live in is not the way God wants it to be. It's marked with brokenness. It's why God sent his son into the world. There are things that are going on in our world. There are things going on in our country. There are things going on under your roof. And there are things going on in my life that are not right. And to be able to say this brokenness, it, it should lead me to mourning and confession if I'd open my eyes and pray, because then the plan of God is to bring redemption and restoration to this world. Whatever your story is, five years from now, I think that if you mourn and you fast and you pray, you will set your sights on something that falls under the ideas of redemption and restoration. Now, let me kind of picture this out for you. This, I'll go through this very quickly. But if the story of God has kind of this arc to it, like this, then think about Nehemiah's story. Uh, God made his first covenant with the nation of Israel. So like in the first part of God's story, there's Israel. And then Nehemiah was just one part of the story of Israel. I could tell you stories of dozens of other men and women within Israel. In some ways, all these arcs live within the larger arc. And then Christ came. And Christ made a new covenant with us. That's the second part of God's story. It's going to go all the way to the end of God's story. And if you're a follower of Jesus, then within the story of Christ is your story. And it's this story that you have where I want you to start to think creation, broken, redemption, restoration. Creation, broken, redemption, restoration. God, what is broken inside of me? What is broken around me? What do you want to restore in me? Where do you want me to be a part of restoring what is around me? Way better than driving a sophisticated sports car five years from now. That you could have a radically transformed soul that experiences the presence of God, but also the power and the calling of God for you to reshape something significant. So if you're gonna do that, it's a different comparison game. <laughs> if you're going to compare, don't compare to other people. If you're going to compare, I want you to think about it like this. <laughs> compare, <laughs> then do it with your past and your future. I wanna ask you to compare you to a previous version of yourself. And that five years from now, you'll compare yourself back to the version of yourself right now, not to anybody else, but to you. Now, I heard a guy who's a philosopher um, describe what I'm gonna describe to you next. And I, I thought, I don't know that he's coming at this from a Christian perspective, but if you're a follower of Jesus, um, I think this will entirely make sense to you and might help you consider what's in front of you in the next five years. This is what I call 
the burden building scale. And if you think about this, the idea of being a zero on the burden building scale is this, that you are not a burden to anyone else. That's good. You're not on the negative side, the burden side, but you're also not building out (laughs) betterment for anyone else. You're just kind of handling yourself. And different ones of you fall at different places on this scale. And we could even think about this in different realms of life. Some of you could just think about this individually. Like, am I personally a burden to someone else? Does someone else have to take care of me right now? Or am I personally making sure other people are taken care of? And one of the ways to conceive how God might want you to aim your life over the next five years is just to move along this scale. And honestly, you may have walked in this door tonight and you say, Greg, to be honest with you, I'm right here. I'm a burden to all kinds of people around me. I'm dependent. I'm a victim. I do that. Then just mourn that. Just confess that. It's okay. And God doesn't expect you to be on the opposite end of the scale tomorrow, or maybe even five years from now. The point is, this gives us a direction to set. That if I'm a negative 10 today, I need to become a negative five before I can ever have this vision of being someone who helps others. You can think about this in different parts of life. You can think about it in your family. Are you a burden to your family? Or are you carrying some people in your family? And the story of the scriptures is to bring redemption and restoration. Carry some other people along the way. You can think about this with your church, right? Do you give more to this church or take more from this church? It's a give or taker scale. That's just just the way that this works. And any community that you're a part of, you could think, well, am I more of a burden or am I building something out? You could think of it with the community that you live in, the town that you live in, the the school that you're a part of. Am Am I kind of a taker on that or am I a giver? Am I a burden or am I building something? And if I could set a course for you for the next five years of your life, I just want to ask you to move on this scale. And to think right now, if I think I'm good, I'm not a burden to anybody. I'd say, no, but your mission is to be used by God to change lives. That's what's in front of you. So do it with a small group of people first. Get two or three people Build something out. Lead a Boy Scout troop. Lead a ministry. Do do something. Set your course on what God would have you to do. And think five years from now how much progress you could make with that. And so I'm going to give you two categories and I'm going to pray and we'll go. Just, Just again, a lot to think about today. You can think about your relationships I want your marriage to be in a different place five years from now. You think about where your your kids are. Some of us are at a stage of life where we're actually thinking about where our parents are five years from now and start to think, I I don't want that to sneak up on me. I have an aim. I might only have five years left with my mom being healthy enough to do all the things I'd love to do with her. I don't want to wake up four years from now and think, "Ah, I missed it. When you start to add five years to the ages of your kids, five years ago, I thought, Jenny and I were about to celebrate our 20th wedding anniversary. And I thought, oh, we should go on a nice trip somewhere, Jenny and I. And then I looked at my kids and I thought, we only have a few years left to take trips with our kids. We'll put the We'll put the anniversary trip off till 25 or 30 or 35. Right now in this window, five years. I'm going to focus it on this. If your marriage is not what you want it to be right now, five years from now, where's it going to be? You can't control the other person. You just control you. Five years from now, that matters. So you could think about it in terms of faces and names, your spouse, your kids, your parents, or you could think about it in terms of 
Maybe you have a relationship with some regret in it. And I talk to people like this all the time. The regret is so deep. You are the dad who abandoned your kids and you wish it were different now. The only thing I know to tell you as a pastor is it can be different, but it will not be different tomorrow or next week. It does not work that way. And if there are deep wounds and deep regrets in a relationship, it will take time. You should aim at it for a long time to restore something that's broken. And then when we think beyond our relationships, we think about the responsibilities. And in particular, I think about the responsibilities that God has given us. He has given us a sense that there's a lost world around us, a world that largely does not know Christ and embrace him. You and I know people who, if they pass away in the next five years, will not go to heaven. They do not have a relationship with God and they are in your proximity. I would even suggest to you that God has placed you in their life and you know the path home. And what more significant thing could you do in the next five years than to lead someone else home forever? If you buy a sophisticated sports car five years from now and you don't lead anyone else home. I mean, you got to reconcile that in your own soul. And then it's not just about introducing people to Christ. It's looking around at this broken world and taking responsibility for some piece of it. You don't have to decide tonight. You just have to fast and you have to pray and you have to let something break your heart. Say, God, the world shouldn't be that way. You're right, it shouldn't. What is your role? What calling does God have on you so that not next month and not even next year, but five years from now, you could be part of restoring that broken? you're going to have to come back next week for weeks two and three. But right now, I just want to pause and pray. and Let this percolate with us as we go into this week. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us enough clarity about the important things of life, helping us see the right subjects to talk about, letting us move beyond the surface to things that are matters of the heart and of your kingdom. And God, I pray that this week you do, if we're quiet and we listen and we fast, you do speak to us. You'd give us some sense, begin to give us some clarity of how you'd like to use us, of what you'd like to do in us, of where we're currently a burden to other people or a group or a church or a community right now and how we actually can flip that so that others can depend on us. So God, we're open to it. We want to listen to you. I pray that you speak in the name of Jesus. Amen. loved being together this weekend. So come back next week for episode two of You in Five Years. Don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, and share button before you leave. And finally, friends, I hope that you know this video is not the church. You are. So go and be the church.